your host, Dr. Rahi Victory, a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist. I am board certified both in Canada and the US. So uh, welcome aboard. Hope uh, that you've had a great week so far. Um, this is one of our first shows since we are officially moving to a Tuesday since the boats last time were always for a Tuesday show. Uh, and uh, so thank you for joining us. Um, we will uh, be having an interesting topic tonight and I'll give you some background history on it. Um, I was kind of flipping through Instagram to see um, basically which sites were good and uh, you know what information was out there and what looked appropriate, what didn't and so on. So during that search, I found a post from an individual that uh, had a master class, I love that part, on um, doing ovulation prediction or monitoring. And their um, test, uh, or, or their, not their test, but their scheme behind this was that you could tell from basal body temperature monitoring, cervical mucus, and my all-time favorite, the position of your cervix. So having heard that, I thought, you know, this just really is a little bit so far beyond the reasonable realm that I, I got to address it. And when I addressed it, she said, well, why don't we just agree to disagree? So I figured, you know what, why don't we just educate people and that way you'll actually know what's going on and, and have a better idea of, you know, what things are available and, and what things are not available and, and which of them work and which of them doesn't. So <clears throat> I'm going to, um, I'm going to screen share. So, <laughs> So uh, we'll go through a couple of things. Um, I don't I have a paper, but I'm not gonna reference the paper today. I'm just gonna talk to you guys and write some stuff down so that you can see it. And hopefully uh, if you have questions along the way this time, um, let's make it interactive and you guys can ask uh, as we go. And that way we can kind of learn and, and figure this stuff out together. So um, there's a couple of different things that work. So number one, you can do basal body temperature. Um, which is just monitoring the temperature uh, of your body. And it can be done intravaginally or just under your tongue. There's different ways to do it. There's urinary LH monitoring, which is where you can check for the breakdown product of LH in your urine and look for the LH surge, which is predictive of your ovulation. And then there's the cervical mucus. Cervix is always CX for us. Um, and depending on whether you're in Canada or the U.S., you have an O.U.S. or a U.S. Um, and so uh, some people use that to determine. And then there's um, what this article said or this poster said, which was cervical position. Um, I'm not even sure what the hell that means, but we're going to check it out anyways. I ran out of space. You see that? <laughs> so um, the question is, uh, you know, which of these works and, and which of them doesn't? And um you know uh, what can we do to try and and improve all of this stuff so uh basically what we decided to do was uh look at the research behind this to see what works and what doesn't so we'll we'll talk about basal body temperature first so basal body temperature is based on the fact that around the time of your ovulation and i'll flip back to a different thing here um, around the time of your ovulation, your basal body temperature, you can see it right here, is going to take a drop. So you can see right on this graph, and I'll kind of highlight it in red here. Right here, you can see that, oh, is that not drawing for us? Yeah, right there. The drop in your temperature signifies the time when your LH is at its lowest. And so if you're monitoring, you're looking for an acute drop, usually around one degree roughly. But as you can see in the graph, it's actually not really a full degree. It's like decimal places. So up here at the beginning, you're looking at about a 36.45 degree. And then down here, it's only 36.15 or 175 or something like that. So, I mean, those are pretty small incremental changes. And because of this, although it can be predictive, the reality is that in 2005, a review article summarized all the data to that point and said, this is a useless test. Why? Because it was only predictive in about 22% of cases. And because it's so poorly predictive, people said, we really should not be using this. So can you determine your ovulation from this? Maybe, 
But is it really predictive? No, it's, it's really not predictive. It doesn't help you because it's so finite. Now, if you're looking at a rise in temperature, yes, because as your progesterone levels go up, it drives up your body temperature. And that's what's happening over here. And now you're going up almost a full degree, but you've missed your ovulation. So now it's like a week later and it's way too late. So it's really not that useful a test. What kinds of things can affect it? Stress, um, your exercise habits, your weight, the time at which you do it, the number of blankets that were on you if you're doing it first thing in the morning, um, you know, all sorts of different things, illness, fever, medications. There are many, many different things that can impact this. So basal body temperature, not a great selection. And so should we be using this? Realistically, no, we should not be using this. Get rid of basal body temperature. So then we look at doing the urinary LH. So is urinary LH predictive? Well, these are basically the pee sticks. So you pee on a stick and it'll tell you when. So depending on which kit you get, you can actually get about a 97% accuracy in predicting your ovulation. Do they always work? No, and the reason is that there are variations in the secretion of your LH, with some people being slow releasers, slow risers, some people being faster. And so because of that, not every LH kit will detect every patient's ovulation. Plus, there are some people that can um, have an LH surge and still not ovulate or be ovulating empty follicles, none of which you can predict with just the urinary kit. So. Is it accurate? Yes, 77% of the time, I'm sorry, 97% of the time, it'll be accurate and you'll be able to detect your ovulation. But is it gonna be universal where you get it every time for every person? No. So should we use it? Yeah, sure, we should because it's a damn good tool. It's really easy to use. You don't have to measure your temperature every morning or worry about the you know, confounding variables there. You just have to pee on a stick and it'll tell you yes or no. We know that normally speaking, somewhere between 36 to 42 hours after you've got a positive, you'll have your surge uh, re result in an ovulation. And so you have a reasonable timing frame to know when to have intercourse using this. What about cervical mucus? Well, cervical mucus does change based on the concentration of estrogen in your body. And there are changes that go along with it including the consistency, whether it's sticky, whether it's not that sticky, whether it's stringy or not, um, the color and all of these things, which people use to kind of denote whether or not they are ovulating. So um, the problem with cervical mucus is in one study, it showed only a 44% uh, efficacy in detecting whether or not you're ovulating where others had as high as about 75%. But realistically, again, it's difficult to do. There's a lot of confounding variables, especially if there's infection present. Um, and not everybody is the same. So some women just naturally have much thicker mucus than other women do. So is this reliable? No. And do you really want to take only a 75% chance when you can get a 97% chance? So cervical mucus, usable, but does it make sense? No, it does not make sense skip doing the cervical mucus, it's not gonna help you. And then the last one is cervical position. So the idea that this masterclass was offering was that by sticking your fingers in and assessing where the position of your cervix was, you would be able to tell whether or not you're ovulating. So um, this is total garbage. First of all, there's not a single study in existence because I looked for one and there's nothing out there. Number two, no one, is capable of sticking their own fingers into their own vagina, which is difficult enough on its own. And then being able to tell the difference in the cervical position. As a gynecologist, all I do all day long is check cervixes and or cervices. And it's still not possible to compare one time to another unless you really, really, really are attuned to what you're doing. So is this reliable? Of course it isn't. Any kind of thing inside you could impact this. Pressure, bloating, uh, a full bowel will move your cervix backwards, forwards, further down, further up. A full bladder will alter the position of your cervix. So it's total garbage to think that someone could teach a master class on the position of your cervix in relation to whether or not you are gonna succeed. So this one also is useless. So what does this leave us with? It leaves us with, 
using the urinary LH kit. Are there any exceptions to this? Um, we can stop the share. Um, so yeah, there are. There are some new systems coming out with basal body temperature monitoring where you actually have to put some kind of probe inside your vagina where it can constantly check your temperature and then it'll tell you why someone would wanna do that instead of just peeing on a stick, I don't understand. But if it's really important to you to monitor your temperature, you may wanna opt for those. They claim a 99% efficacy um, and sensitivity in detecting ovulation. Whether that's true or not, nobody knows yet. And again, there are gonna be a lot of confounding variables in that. So whether or not you are feverish, whether or not you've recently been sick, did you exercise, did you just have sex? Um, were you excited about having sex? You know, anything like that will change your temperature. It'll cause stress, it'll cause alterations, and therefore it will throw off the results. So super important. If you see stuff on the internet, don't always believe it because it's on Instagram. Make sure you're getting scientifically validated data. It is not okay to just read stuff. And people are actually making money teaching classes, master class on stuff that is absolute gibberish. So I feel terrible that I even have to do this. We shouldn't have to do this. People should be decent enough to know that what they're selling is just total nonsense but apparently some people see an opportunity for money and they go for it when they really shouldn't be because it's quite inhumane to do so. <clears throat> I will probably pick the topic of induction of labor next week because last night I had a great um, episode where I found someone that was claiming that you should not be induced even if you've made it to 42 weeks of gestation, which nobody does anymore, by the way. Um, because it wasn't necessary. And when I pointed out to that individual that the risk of stillbirth was massively increased, they said, no, it's not. And when I showed it to them with studies, they actually blocked me from being on their, their uh, Instagram uh, account. So I think I'll review that just so everybody knows the truth about uh, induction labor um, and knows the safety of induction labor because lots of people, once they're pregnant from our wonderful treatments, um, want to know should they be induced or shouldn't they? And we actually encourage our patients to get induced at 39 weeks. And so I'll go through that data with you next week and explain it to you. So thank you for joining Factor Fiction. Not so much uh, uh, Factor Fiction as per se, but it is a fact that <clears throat> the urinary LH kit is very useful and you can use that, but the other ones really are not. So don't bother measuring your basal body temperature. Don't try checking your cervical mucus. And for the love of God, don't take a master class on cervical position because there is no such thing. Uh, so uh, we're going to take your questions. Were there any during the uh, segment on that or nothing on these ones? All right, fire away. 